Hello friend, welcome back to Acre Homestead. I am so grateful you are here today. Today we are in the kitchen, but we're not gonna be doing any cooking. We are gonna sit down and have a conversation. My name is Becky, if you are new, and I have a six month old. I am married to my husband of eight years, and we live on a homestead where our goal is to grow as many fruits and veggies as we can, and to source as much local food as possible what we don't grow. So what we're gonna do today is I had put a post on my community tab and asking if you all had any questions because it's been, I think about eight months since I have done a Q&A. And so a lot of things have changed. So I thought we'd sit down and have a conversation. So if you are busy today, go ahead and put some headphones on and go about your day because we're just gonna be sitting here and talking. The way I have broken up this Q&A is I went through all the questions you guys had asked on my community tab and I put them into categories. Some of them kind of overlap into other categories, but for the most part, I have four categories here. I have family, postpartum, and motherhood, and baby update is number one. Number two is YouTube and work-life balance. Number three is homestead and garden, and number four is food preservation and food storage. The first section we're gonna go over, and it's probably the one that I had the absolute most questions about, is family, postpartum, and motherhood update. A lot of the questions were very similar, so I tried to pair them back and find really themes that were happening, and hopefully I can hit all the points that you all are wondering. So the first question Maya asks is, how are you doing postpartum? Because the pregnancy and delivery, there were some complications and it was a little bit challenging. And so the question is, how am I doing after that? We are now six months out and I am feeling fantastic. And another question I got a lot is how is motherhood going? And it's awesome. I've been loving it. It has been more fun than I had expected. It's, we have been blessed with what I think is a pretty easy baby. I mean, he is the most experience I've ever had, so I don't have a lot to go off of. I don't have a ton of little babies in my life that I have been this closely around, obviously. And I would say we were blessed with a really easy baby. He's super fun. He is teething now, so he's a little bit fussier than he's been his entire life. But overall, I think that it's been wonderful and I love it. I absolutely love it. So postpartum, I'm doing really, really well. All the complications that I had, I am completely better. Um, if you didn't watch my birth story or my rehospitalization story after the birth, I had severe, severe preeclampsia and I had a spinal fluid leak from the epidural. And so the first couple weeks after he was born were pretty challenging with my, my health, like my body, but now, 100% better. I'm off all the blood pressure medications. I am. I have no side effects with headaches or back pain or anything like that. And even, I, I've talked a little bit about it, but I've had bladder issues in my adulthood. Um, interstitial distitis is something that I've struggled with. And I don't know why, but overall, I feel like the pregnancy like reset my body and I haven't even had any issues with that. So that's been a huge blessing. Another thing I am really grateful for is I've not struggled with any postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety. In the past, I have struggled with anxiety, just kind of like general low-grade anxiety, and depending on different things that are happening in my life, sometimes it will spike. And so I was a little bit worried that with you know the hormones and all of that, that that could be something that would be triggered, but it hasn't, so I've been super blessed that that's something that I've not dealt with postpartum. Sonia had asked that she would like a baby update and she respects the fact that I'd like to keep his privacy private, but I can give you an update on him. He is doing well. He's hitting all his milestones. He's doing fantastic and we're just really blessed to have him. He's been a huge blessing and positive thing in our life. Sonia also asked what was my plan to introduce foods to him and he is now six months old so we're kind of just starting that process. I had my plan, even though I, I didn't really have a plan, was to kind of do what my, my mom did and she just fed us what they were eating and so she didn't really buy the baby food jars or the baby food rice cereals or anything like that. It was just whatever was on the dinner table she would cut up and 
dice up small enough for us to eat and that's kind of what we've been doing just introducing different flavors to him and he's been really enjoying that so it's kind of we're following the baby led weaning method and we're starting more with higher fat things like avocado and egg yolks and those types of things instead of your traditional like rice cereals and he's been really really enjoying it it's super funny when we feed it to him he you know like scrunches up his face like he doesn't like it and then he wants more and more so that's been super fun just seeing what he is enjoying <laughs> and her next question was do we plan do i plan to make jarred baby food for him and maybe when he's a little bit older right now he eats so little <laughs> that um I haven't really thought the need to make dedicated food because he eats so little, but maybe I will make some of those, I, you can buy those reusable pouches. Maybe I'll make some of that kind of stuff up and put those in there. But I don't really know that yet because we're not really quite yet to that point. But I know that I would rather make as much at home because Josh and I eat the majority of home than purchasing the little pouches because those can get kind of pricey. I've looked at them and so if we can do it at home i would rather do that jody asked i would love you to talk about how you and josh managed your schedule with the little one i was impressed how the two of you worked as a team with the newborn so josh has been the best thing when it comes to becoming parents he is the best teammate and from the get-go with me being in the hospital he took over and he basically was a solo parent there for a couple days because I was in a hospital bed for a few days after he was born and I couldn't really do that much. Um, it was all I could do to survive from one day to the next just because with all the pain I was in. But I had no worries. Josh just stepped up, took care of him, and I didn't have to worry about that. He has just since then from day one he takes full responsibility and he's been a fantastic partner the way that we had worked it out is josh was on paternity leave for one month where he was completely off work for one month and i did not have that luxury when you work for yourself you don't get paid time off so if i don't work i don't get paid and this is what i do for a living i get to hang out with you I had about two weeks after he was born where I had batch enough footage, which was a blessing because I was able to keep posting my videos and I could take about two weeks off fully from YouTube. And then after that, I slowly started to film again and I started with easier ones where I would sit down and chat with you. And so the first month, Josh did all the night feedings from 10 to 3 a.m. And so I was able to go to bed around 10 and I would take over the feedings at three, anytime after three, I would take over those. So usually he would then wake up at five. So I was able to get a good night's sleep because I would have to get up and work during the day. And that worked out really, really well. So because Josh was not having to get up and go to work, he was able to kind of work into the night a little bit better. And Josh inherently is a night owl. He enjoys staying up and I enjoy getting up early. I am an early bird. And so it's just worked out really well for us. Now the baby is sleeping through the night and so we both are getting a good night's sleep. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day responsibilities of taking care of him, we just take turns. We don't have any like set, this is your time, this is my time or anything like that. We just, we enjoy it. So we both want to take care of him. And you know, there's times where we both need a break. You know, if I have been with him all day. Sometimes when Josh gets home, I say I need, you know, an hour, a mental hour where I just go and sit in the bathtub or go out into the garden by myself and Josh picks up the reins and takes care of him. And same thing with Josh. Sometimes he's feeling that he needs a break and I take over and we've just been able to kind of step in. I watched a reel the other day where she was talking about how marriage is not 50-50. It's where if one person has 40% to give, then if you can communicate that, then the other person can pick up the 60%. And if one person has, you know, 80% to give that particular time and the other person only has 20, then you kind of want to work towards about 100% total. And if you both are at, if I'm at 20% and Josh is at 20%, we need to really communicate that with each other because we're both not at 100%. And that's how 
it's worked. I had never really heard it articulated until I saw that reel and it was really brilliant, but that's how Josh and I work really, where we are both working together, but we realize that sometimes one of us needs a break and we pick up the slack and so that's worked really well. Stacy asks, what do I do for self-care? And I think, and she also asked, what do Josh and I like to do for fun? So what I do now for self-care, <laughs> being a mom, is I just learn when I need a break. So like I was just saying before, sometimes I go and I spend an hour in the garden all by myself, listening to the birds and just taking that time to enjoy some alone time or I really like to take baths and I really like to go out to dinner with my friends and taking time where I can have adult conversation with my friends and just enjoy hanging out with them. And that's kind of what Josh and I like to do together as well. Josh and I are both skiers, which clearly we had a baby in December. We did no skiing <laughs> this year from being, you know, pregnant at the beginning of the winter and then having a newborn skiing wasn't something we were able to work into our routine but this next year we will be going skiing and we really enjoy working on projects together so we're getting back into that we really enjoy going and sitting and having a nice dinner somewhere and we enjoy just hanging out we do a lot of just hanging out together and so that's what we like to do Abigail asks, how has motherhood influenced our homestead journey? And for me, I think it has put into focus what is really important and what I want to devote my time to. So for me, I'm super passionate about growing as many fruits and vegetables as I can and preserving those fruits and vegetables, sourcing local produce that I can't grow. And it has just reinforced the thing that that's what I need to focus on. You know, I've had these dreams where it'd be super fun to, you know, have a milk cow and grow my own chicken and my pork and beef, but those aren't things that I have. I only have so much time in the day. And so I need to like focus in on the time that I have and what I'm the most passionate about, what I already have some knowledge in and kind of focus on that. So growing food, preserving food, and then realizing I don't have to do it all. None of us have to do it all. And even if we wanted to do it all, we couldn't do it all. So it's just reinforced the fact that it is okay to enlist the help of local farmers and, you know, purchase my meat from my local farmer where I get my beef and my pork. And I just bought a flat of strawberries because I'm not going to grow a year's worth of strawberries for Josh and I, and that is okay. And so it's just reinforced the fact that that is okay and that's what I'm doing. Now, the only other big plan that I have for the homestead in the new future is next year I would like to get honeybees. I think that is something that I would really, really like to do, but I knew that this year was not gonna be a good year for it. We needed to focus on the garden being built out. We needed to focus on becoming a family of three, and then next year I'll have a little bit more bandwidth to focus on bees. But it's just really enforced the fact that we don't have to do it all and do what's important to us. So spending time with my family and gardening, those are kind of my two big things. Gabrielle asks, what are some of the baby items you purchased that you absolutely love and what are some of the things that you didn't really find necessary? So my one of my favorite things is baby carrying because I wear him all the time. Even now, I love putting him on me and going about my day. It's been a huge blessing being able to use my hands and have him content on me. He now goes on my back the majority of the time because when I'm in the garden, I can't bend over if he's in my front. So he's on my back and he loves it. And so that's been one of the best things. Another good thing that I didn't think I was going to use, but Josh really insisted on it was a stroller because I assumed I would just wear him all the time. And at home, he is on me all the time when I'm going about my day. But when I go out, I love the stroller too. And so it's been really nice to be able to take him out of the car seat, plop him in the stroller if I'm just going into a store quickly or if I'm, yeah, basically if I'm just running in somewhere, it's been really nice having him be able to be in the stroller instead of getting him out of the car seat, putting him on me and then having to put him back in the car seat. Because we usually... I mean, he doesn't go a ton of places because Josh and I are homebodies, so we stay here a lot together. Um, so he, 
usually when I'm going around and running errands with him, it's just like a short little in the store, out of the store. And so it's kind of funny. I didn't think I would be a stroller person, but I like the stroller Josh picked out. It's worked really well. It's easy to get in and out of the car, put the car seat in it. And so that's been really nice. What are some things that I don't really use? When I did my, I didn't have a baby shower or anything. And I tried to keep my baby equipment purchasing down to a, like a more minimum type thing because I tend to be more of a minimalist when it comes to life in general. A lot of things tends to stress me out. And so I didn't purchase, I feel like all the gadgets and gadgets. Um, we got a swing that we were able to borrow from my sister-in-law. That's been something that's been huge too because my sisters have kids and my sister-in-laws have kids. So we've been able to share a lot of equipment and I'm really grateful for that because some of the things that I maybe would have purchased, he's not really into. He doesn't find them you know, entertaining or, oh, you know what he really likes is he likes the Jolly Jump Up. That's been a really good thing. I really like the monitor Josh bought us. It's one that's not on Wi-Fi, so it just has a screen. And so I've got pictures of him when he's taking a nap. But I don't, I don't think there's anything that I bought that I don't really use. A lot of people, when I watch those what you use and what you don't, people talk about a baby changing station. We use ours all the time, but we have a ranch level home. And so it's just nice to go and do that versus I know that if his bedroom was upstairs and the baby changing station was upstairs, we probably wouldn't use it. But because it's right off the living room, we use that all the time. And yeah, I can't really think of anything that I bought that we don't really use a couple things I didn't buy and I waited till he was born but then I ended up borrowing most of the things from friends and family when I'm done here I'll probably think of a list of things but for now I can't think of anything off the top of my head hope asks am I happy with my choice to keep my baby off of the channel and I am the reason I decided to do this originally was because some of my YouTube peers who run YouTube channels had recommended that that's something that they had wished they had done from the very beginning. And so I took their advice and I decided to go ahead and just put that boundary out there. And originally it was for his privacy and it still is 100% for his privacy. And for, you know, he, I can anytime decide to put him on here, but once he's out there, it's really hard to take, it's impossible to like give him his privacy back. And what I have also realized is this is my job. I love what I do. I love that I get to spend time with you cooking and gardening and doing food preservations projects as my job. It is a huge, huge blessing because I'm so passionate about it, but it is my job. And being his mom is a job too, but it's a completely different thing. It's not my work. And so I realized that when I, if I had brought him into the channel, I would be bringing him into my workplace. And I just love that I set that boundary from the beginning. And so when I am with him, I am his mom. <laughs> I am a hundred percent present. And I really, really like that. I'm, you know, I, if I was a dental hygienist still, I wouldn't be bringing him to work every day. And so it's kind of the same thing. It's a little bit more um, gray because I work from home. And so it would be easy to bring him into it, but it's just really nice having that boundary so that when I'm working, I'm working, I'm fully present in that. And when I'm with him, I am fully present with him. So I hope that makes sense that that might not have been the original reason why I decided to keep him off the channel, but now it's one of my biggest reasons is that I am not in work mode when I'm being his mom. And I wanna say thank you for everyone who is super supportive on that decision. Sarah asks, how do you juggle motherhood and full-time work? It's such a balance, isn't it? Thank you for your continued content. This is a perfect question to segue into the YouTube and work kind of section. So it has been a juggle to be able to balance the two. 
One thing I did, and this was a recommendation from my friend Jay Morell. You all know her from Jay Morell Stewart. She's got a YouTube channel. If you don't, but I'm sure you all know who she is. She had encouraged me. I went to the Home Centers of America conference in October and I was eight months pregnant and she had encouraged me that I need to hire an editor. That's something that I had done all 100% on my own up until that point. So right before the baby was born, I found my editor and he is fantastic. And so one thing that I have done is I have outsourced some of my work and that is something I have outsourced. Now, because I've outsourced editing, it doesn't mean I don't have still quite a bit of computer work to do. And so by helping balance, you know, adding in a baby, which takes up a tremendous amount of time and it's where my, you know, where I want to spend the majority of my time, I needed to realize what are things that I can outsource. And that was something I could outsource so that I have more time to spend time with my baby. And this goes directly into Eileen's question. She says, I would love to see a day in the life video from morning to night and what it's like being a YouTuber, kind of behind the scenes. You may, you make it look so easy, but I know that there's so much work that gets put into a channel on top of actually filming. And so the way that my days work, and this goes into a lot of these questions, but the way my days work is they all look really, really different. I do not have a set filming days and computer work days. So you, you may have heard me refer to this is my computer work day because I have, I do have days where I film and then I have days where I sit down and I'm on my computer all the time. So because my baby is not on my videos, I need someone to take care of him. When he was a newborn and he slept, you know, 90% of the time, I could have him sleeping in the bassinet. Oh, that was another thing we loved was the wheelie bassinet because I could wheel him all over the place and it was fantastic. Is a lot of times I would be filming and he would be napping in you know, not too far away from me. But now that he's six months old and he's needs a lot more, you know, interaction and stimulation and he loves to talk, I need someone to be hanging out with him while I am filming. In Washington State, paternity leave is three months. And so Josh took the first month off completely. And then when he went back to work after that one month, he was able to have two days a week where he wasn't working. So if I had a film day, then Josh could watch the baby while I was filming. And sometimes Josh would have meetings or things like that. So he might only get one day where he could take off in the week. And you get one, you get three full months and you don't have to take them in order. And so I would just plan my filming days around Josh's work schedule. And another thing I have is I am so blessed that my baby has three grandparents that live within 30 minutes of me and they love hanging out with him. They text me all the time. When do I get baby time? And can I watch him and hang out with him while you you know, need a project that needs to be done? And so that has been how I've been able to have film days. And a lot of times when I have film days, I like to bulk film if I can, where I can get one or two videos filmed in one day. So that might be a really long day, but I can focus, I can get it filmed and then and I can enjoy the process. I love what I do. I love that I get to interact with you and I get to do with the things that I'm passionate about and I can focus my time on that and try to do as best of a job at the project at hand and at hanging out with you as I can. And then when I'm with him, I can focus on him. Josh, this is his final week of paternity leave. And so I am gonna have to bring someone in probably two days a week to help me so that I can still have those two days a week where I can film. And if I'm not able to get my videos all filmed in those two days, what I can do too is I can film on the weekends, which is really great. So on the days that I call computer work days are days where it's just me and the baby home alone typically, and it's where I review video. So my editor, after I film, I send him the footage, he edits it, and then it comes back to me, and I get to review the video, I add the voiceovers, I cut anything out that I'm like, ooh, maybe I'm talking too much in this one spot. I'll cut that out. Once I am happy with the way the video is, then I put it up onto YouTube. And on those days, I write the description. I write any recipes that need to go onto the blog. I write the thumbnail, or I make the thumbnail. I write the description. And that, that type of work I can do with the baby around me, no problem. I can 
it, it's, it takes a lot more energy to actually edit a video from raw footage to where, where I get it. And that would be kind of challenging to do with a baby who needs interaction. But if I'm just reviewing it and adding voiceover, I can do that with the baby hanging around me. And that's worked really well. So I usually try to just like, sometimes I try to film two videos in a day. I try to get two videos reviewed in a day if possible. So I have my filming days or project days, and then I have my computer work days. And then I try to have days where I don't do anything, any work, but you know, the blessing about my work is I work from home and I can adjust my schedule as needed. So if the baby needs me, I can stop filming and I can go hang out with him. The majority of the time he's here, 90% of the time, unless one of the grandmas wants to take him. And so I can just pause what I'm doing. It happens multiple times throughout a video where I will stop what I'm doing and I will hang out with him, feed him, take care of him, because he is my top priority. But by having someone, a support person, Josh or a grandparent or somebody, it's nice because I just have that support. So I've been blessed that I've got a village that helps. This organically kind of segues into Morgan's question and she wants to know what is my usual weekly plan and my weekly plan it really does vary depending on what days Josh was able to stay home with me what days the grandparents want to or have the ability to hang out with the baby and so I don't do anything fancy I have this little planner that I got at Target and it says Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday weekend and at some point usually Monday or Sunday, I sit down with this planner and I know, okay, you know, Josh had this weekend off or one of his grandparents can watch the baby this day or whatever it might be. I write that down and then I write down what needs to happen. One of the questions was, how do I plan my content? Well, my content generally is just what needs to happen on my homestead at any particular time, whether that's planting potatoes or organizing a pantry or whatever it might be and I kind of write down what needs to happen and then I can put whatever needs to happen on the day that I have the support system and then on the days that are computer days I usually take my laptop into the living room and I hang out with the baby with my laptop in the living room or in the sunroom and I know okay I need to review this video I need to write this blog post I need to plan this newsletter or whatever it might be and I jot them down on this simple sheet. I'm usually only working about one week ahead of what I have planned to film and what needs to be done because my weeks look so different. Maybe in the future I will have every Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are film days and every Tuesday and Thursday are computer days, but that's not the way my life works. I have just learned to be flexible and I just go about a week in advance. So back to Morgan's question. She says, hi, Becky. I want to know how your usual weekly plan goes. We just talked about that. You've said a ton of times it's a computer day and or a cooking slash garden day. As someone who gets hyper focused on a task the whole day and later feels guilty about not doing more than that one particular task. Well, I want to know how do you schedule those intensive days where you mainly focus on one thing? but somehow managed to have a clean house, meals every night, and computer work done. Well, I just know I need to get done my tasks that I've planned, and I don't feel guilty if I don't get other things done that day because I have given myself permission to work on that task. If it's a garden day, I put on here garden day, and if I don't review a video, that's okay because I know that the next day I have allotted time to review that video. And to think that my house is always clean is not true. <laughs> Don't go into my laundry room right now because I have four baskets of laundry in there. Half of them are clean, half of them need to go through the wash, but right now I'm sitting here having a conversation with you and my laundry is not getting done and I don't feel guilty about it. One way that I've helped is because I tell myself what I'm gonna be doing and if I'm doing the thing that I tell myself I'm supposed to be doing, then I don't need to feel guilty about not having other things done. None of us can get all the things done, none of us. And so just figuring out what is the most important thing that needs to be done on this day. If I have somebody's help to hang out with the baby, then I need to be doing something like a project. If I don't have any extra hands around in the house, 
I know that I need to be focusing on reviewing video and hanging out with the baby all day. Because those are things that I can do while he's napping and if I need to break, take a break, I just stop it and focus on him and that's okay. None of us can do it all. And just because you see me doing a ton of things in a video, you know, there's times where I just sit on the couch and watch TV, but that would not be entertaining to watch me sit and watch my reality TV, because that's what I like to watch. <laughs> and so um, it's okay to be hyper-focused on a, a task and get that task done and then move on to the next task. And I have found that it helps if I at least write it down because then I feel like, okay, I'm telling myself what I need to be doing. If I'm not doing any of the other things, I know that I can get to it tomorrow. But I, I'm not gonna lie that when my life, if I've, if I've written a plan and something happens that deviates from that plan, I'm human and that can really fluster me. So if I have a big project day planned and for whatever reason I need to not do that project on that day, I can get frustrated. And I have learned that having a baby teaches you to go with the flow. <laughs> and that's what I'm learning. That's the character building it's giving me in motherhood is learning to go with the flow. I couldn't control, you know, my birth plan. I couldn't control my pregnancy. Um, I can't control my everyday work life either. I just have to go with the flow. And it does help if I give myself grace, but that feels really long-winded a little bit into that. Victoria asks, what my kind of day-to-day -day looks like with the baby and being a working mom. I kind of went over that. And then she says, I struggle with wanting to be productive and to be more efficient, but I'm unsure of where to start. I can be doing chores all day and nothing seems to be getting done. This kind of goes back to Morgan's question where she said, I always have dinner on the table. So first off, I don't get everything done. I figure out what's the most important thing. I get that done. I like to batch things, whether that's batch cooking, You've seen my freezer cooking videos. I do a lot of freezer cooking videos because that is something I have to do in my life because I we don't eat out except for when we're being very intentional. Like I said, Josh and I enjoy eating out, but we have cut out random Tuesday night eating out. We just don't do that. We used to do it a lot and then when I lost my job and COVID happened and all those things, we realized how much money we were spending on the not intentional eating out. And so I learned that I needed to cook it from home more. And some nights working full time, I don't wanna cook. And so by learning to batch cook, I can have homemade food all the time. And I don't have to worry about thinking about cooking all the time. And I've brought that into my work life. I need to batch film when possible. If I need to film two, two videos on a day, last filming day, I film two videos in a day then that's what I need to do. Or if I need to batch reviewing videos or batch re writing recipes or whatever it might be, I need to try to use my time as efficiently as possible and doing more than one of a thing at a time, if at all possible. So what I would say for the efficiency, if you are struggling with that, it would be for me, the first thing that needed to happen was to learn how to fill my freezer with homemade options, have a list of recipes I can make in less than 10 minutes, even if that's putting a quesadilla on the stove and being okay with that being dinner and giving yourself grace. But also what I have learned is that I like to have my appliances work for me. So I do have a ton of laundry in my laundry room, but I do have a load of laundry going and in the washer and I have a load of laundry going in the dryer right now while I'm sitting here and talking to you, the beauty of living in the 21st century is we have appliances that can work for us. My dishwasher's not going because it's loud and I'm talking with you, but if it was full and needed to be running and I was not in this room, I would have that going as well. And another thing is learning to be okay with not getting it all done because we can never get it all done. And one thing that I find kind of funny is my kitchen. Because I have a working kitchen, I do so much cooking I wonder why I'm always cleaning my kitchen. It's because it's a working kitchen and it's just one of those chores that's never gonna be done. Cleaning the kitchen, doing laundry, you finish it just in time to clean it again because you're gonna cook it. <laughs> so I don't know if that was helpful, but I'm not an expert on you know, how to get it all done because I don't get it all done. 
I don't. I just don't always show my laundry room when it's a pile. Sometimes I do though. Sometimes you see my laundry room and it looks like a bomb went off. And one thing I wanna say that now that I am a mom and I do have a little baby, what I am trying to learn to do is obviously focus on what's the most important thing. And if he wants to take a nap on my chest at any particular time, I wanna soak that up and I want to enjoy that and give myself grace that if I don't get something done in that moment because I am having him sleep on me and take a nap on me, in the future, I'm never gonna regret that I put those things aside to enjoy that moment. Now, we do need to you know, have our houses run efficiently, but it's okay to take in those moments and set aside the things that just don't get done. Our little ones are only gonna be little for so long and you have a lifetime to clean your house. And so if it's not perfect, that's okay. And trust me, I have to remind myself of those things all the time too. So we're all humans at this thing called life. Amanda asks, she would like an update on the website Scratch Pantry. <laughs> this is something Josh has been working on for a while now. And he told me on Sunday that he was scary close to being done. So whatever that means from a computer programmer who is programming a new website, that's where it is. And when it is up, I have seen what Josh has done and it is so beautiful. It is stunning. You all are gonna be so much happier with the user friendliness of it and the printability of a recipe, the searchability of things. It's gonna be so fantastic but I cannot tell you exactly when it's gonna be done because I don't know. I just know that Josh told me it's scary close. Amanda also asks, I'm very curious about how the roll recipe turned out. And I think she's referring to the frozen rolls. I am working on a guide on how to fill your freezer with homemade frozen rolls, French bread, sandwich bread, pizza dough, biscuits and pie crust and I am almost done with that. So as soon as that, all those recipes are perfected, they are written up. I will let you know when those are done, but I do have the roll recipe done. I am just working on getting it all written up. So that's another thing is things don't happen as quickly as I'd like, but they happen when they happen. And so I'm working on it and that's happening on a computer work day. That kind of goes into the food questions. Now I will talk about some food questions. TE asks, if you take a culinary tour to any country, which country would you choose? I think this is a really fun question because Josh and I used to go to this restaurant before 2020 and all the craziness. Every year there was a restaurant in Cannon Beach in Oregon, on the Oregon coast where they sat 15 people a night and it was a culinary experience. It was a four or five course meal. He cooked the whole thing in front of you. There was only, you know, 10 or 15 diners. And so this is why Josh and I now, we don't go try not to do like takeout and fast food and random eating out because when we go out, we like to do these kind of like more fun experiences and they can be a little bit more expensive. So we like to take our eating out money or eating out budget and kind of go to restaurants where they're cooking things that I do not have the skill to tackle, whether it's a cuisine I don't know how to cook or they just are better at cooking <laughs> than I am, or they're actually making the food in the kitchen. And this man who ran this restaurant in Cannon Beach, he would go on a culinary tour every year to Italy and he would take a group of people and it was a whole food tour and they would make homemade pasta and they would go to wineries and, and they would go to olive groves and talk about olive oil. And Josh and I have always, always wanted to do that with him. I don't know if he still does it because 2020 and all the craziness, I don't know if, if that's still a thing, but Italy or France are the two countries where Josh and I have talked about, we would love to go and do some sort of culinary tour and like take food classes and go to farms and vineyards and olive groves and all those things. But we also, <laughs> there is a um, chocolate company called Dandelion Chocolate out of San Francisco. And they take groups of people to like Tanzania and all these cool countries where coffee's grown. And they go on a coffee tour of these countries 
And I've always wanted to do that too, because I'm into food. I really like food. I like watching videos about food. I like learning about food. And so something like that would be really cool. I thought that was a fun question because it's on our bucket list. We just have never been able to make something like that happen. But maybe in the future, Josh and I will be able to do something like that together. Susie asks, have I ever tried the DIY pan release? It is a shortening and flour mixture you can buy in the store. And I have never tried it. I have heard about it. I tend to not buy anything with shortening in it if possible, but I have seen that you can make it from scratch and keep it in your refrigerator and you can use coconut oil or butter or something like that. So I do need to look into that instead of using spray and then uh, flour like I traditionally do when I make cakes. So that is something I should look into for sure. Kimberly asks, can I do another big freezer cooking meal day? It's been a while since I've done that. And I do have that planned. It's in the works. I am writing a guide that goes along with it. So the reason I have not done one in since the baby was born is because I am working on a written guide to go along with it so that you all can have a written guide. And if you're interested in that, I can leave a link for my email down below and I will send out an email when that is available, but I'll also make a video and to, co to go along with it. Ruth asks, I'm confused about the pie crust. Do you pre-bake them before freezing them or do you fill them and then bake them? I'm assuming you're talking about when I freeze pie crust. So what I do when I make pie crust is I make my pie crust, I shape it into a disc, I wrap it in saran wrap, I throw that in the freezer. And then when I want to bake with that pie crust, I put it in the refrigerator overnight, I let it thaw in the refrigerator, and then I roll it out just like I would if I had made the pie crust that day. I hope that answers your question, Ruth. Sue asks, has there ever been a dish that you've made that you and Josh could not eat? Sue, I don't think there's any, well, there's been, I have made stuff that's too spicy for Josh, and so he won't really go back for the leftovers on that. And, I haven't really, I have made stuff that, yeah, is not that good. Because I do a lot of cooking where I don't follow recipes. I don't know if it, there's happened very many times where there's stuff that we actually cannot eat it. Usually we can suffer our way through it. But sometimes there has been dishes where the chickens benefit from my experimenting. So yes, not everything that comes out of this kitchen is a winner. Generally, what happens the most is if I make something too spicy though, um, but I've been trying to get better at that because then I am the one that ends up having to eat all of the leftovers. Sharon asks if Josh ever gets inspired to cook in the kitchen and she had heard me mention that Josh made me waffles one day. Josh does not really enjoy being in the kitchen. He's a really good cook, but it's not something that he enjoys. He's not super passionate about it and I am, so I'm the one who generally cooks. And he generally only cooks if it is a holiday like Valentine's Day or my birthday or Mother's Day. That's when he made me waffles. And so he's not really one to spend a lot of time in the kitchen. But when he does, he does a fantastic job. I think that if he wasn't so busy working on the website or doing projects around the home like our trim project or building me chicken coops or whatever it might be. If he wasn't busy doing all those things, he might enjoy being in the kitchen, but his time is better spent doing the things that I don't know how to do. Since I know how to cook, I cook. Cindy asks, when you have a lot of fruits and vegetables, what do you do to keep them fresh for as long as possible before, so you can eat them before they go bad? What I've really tried to work on lately is not to purchase too many things that can go bad and try to learn like how much we can go through in a specific amount of time. And when I buy fresh produce, I like to first go through the items that I know are gonna go bad faster and wait and use the produce items that are gonna go bad later and you use them later. So for example, if I buy carrots, cauliflower, a pepper, zucchini, and lettuce, I know that I should eat the lettuce and zucchini and pepper first and then the cauliflower and the carrots I can leave for the last because the carrots can stay in my refrigerator for many weeks and they're gonna be just fine. And I don't do anything in particular except I do have those green produce bags that I like to use, but I usually only use those on garden fresh produce. Um, and then I, do, I don't do very much 
preserving of items that I buy at the grocery store to, I don't can a bunch of those types of things. So that's not a way I would preserve it. I might throw, if I had some onions that were looking like they were about to sprout, I might chop those up and throw those in the freezer or throw them in the freeze dryer. But I don't really do any preservation methods from things that I buy in the grocery store unless I absolutely have to. But generally I just work really hard on trying to eat them up and knowing which ones are gonna go bad first and working my way through them. And then sometimes though, things do end up going to the chickens. One of the best things about having chickens is I do have a little less guilt when I have food waste, but I still, ugh, it does bother me. Tosh asked, is there a difference between kitchen gadgets and kitchen tools? And are there any tools you have purchased that have ended up being gadgets that you just don't gravitate towards? And I am a big fan of multi-use tools. I like my kitchen tools to serve a myriad of purposes, but there are some kind of like gadgety type things that I really like. I like my jar lifter, which all that does is open my canning jars, but I open canning jars all the time. So I use that, but if I can't find that, a good old spoon or knife works just as well. I like my zester even though that's a very specific use. I use that all the time. And some that I have used that I don't, or I have that I don't use very much are probably my garlic peeler. That works really well if you have aged garlic. But when I, a lot of my garlic is fresh, relatively. And if a garlic clove is not dry enough, then it is hard to, use those roller garlic peelers to get the papers off. So I have those. They just don't really work for the majority of the year when I'm using my garlic. They work toward, like right now, my garlic, all of it is now in the freezer. But if I had whole heads of garlic, those cloves were harvested last July. They're dry enough that I could use that, but I don't have any fresh garlic in my house right now. Um, and I have those chopper things and I don't use them very often because I just really love a good sharp knife and a really good cutting board. But I try, like I've said, I'm kind of more on the minimalist side, so I try to keep things that I'm not using regularly out of my house. Hope asks, how do I keep critters out of food storage? I really like five gallon buckets, food grade five gallon buckets. I like glass containers. I try not to store any dried goods that isn't in a hard-sided something so that it would take a lot of work for a critter to get into it. Um, so I don't store anything in the original paper packaging if I buy something in bulk. I like to put it into different packaging. Now we're gonna go ahead and talk about gardening and homesteading. I'll try to get through these questions pretty quickly. Margaret asks, she would like to know a little bit more about the deer fence. So the deer fence that goes around the entire garden and it also encom uh, encompasses our backyard fence. So like the dog fence, it is made out of a couple different types of lumber depending on which part of the fence. The posts are a pressure treated lumber and then the horizontal braces are made out of fur and then there's a cedar cap that goes along the top and the actual fencing is hog panels and we went with hog panels because we wanted the deer fence to be see-through one of the main reasons we bought our homestead was because of the view and so we didn't want to have any sort of walled off or privacy fence because we wanted to be able to see through it and so the hog panels were a great way to create a beautiful fence that was see-through Dari asks, do I have a written garden plan? No, I don't. That's one of the reasons why I started a YouTube channel is so that I could have documentation of what I do from year to year to year. I'm not someone who loves journaling, documenting, writing things down. And so video is a great way for me to document it. And I am a gardener that goes out there, figures out where I wanna put things just by feeling and thinking, this bed this year seems like a good bed to plant potatoes in. So that's what I do. One of my other friends asks about my written plan. I don't have a written plan. I just go with the flow. But she also says that I want to try gardening next year in a small scale. I'm already lost just thinking about how much I need to be prepared. And I'm anxious about killing plants. If you see this, thank you so much for all you teach on this channel. Well, thank you so much for watching. What I wanna encourage you is 
one, you're never going to learn it all in one year. You're never going to learn it all in a lifetime. I am feel like I started over completely this year at this new homestead. We've got new weather, new conditions, new soil, all the things. I am, I am learning along with you. One thing to know, you will absolutely kill plants. I have already killed so many things this year. We aren't born with green thumbs. We need to cultivate and learn and grow our green thumb. And I heard a quote somewhere on Instagram, the more plants you kill, the better gardener you'll become. Just because it means you keep trying, you keep trying, you keep trying. And every time I have something die or I kill it or it doesn't work out, that's where I learn more for my next year. So don't be discouraged that you don't know what you don't know. Just go out there and enjoy the process. And the awesome thing is we live in the 21st century where we today do not have to, at this moment in time and in history, who knows what will ever happen in the future, but for right now, we don't have to rely on the food that we grow. And, and I mean, I wanna grow as much as I can. I'm super excited about the opportunity to be able to grow you know, as much as possible but we don't have to rely on it. We aren't gonna starve. We have a grocery store we can go to. So just go out there and enjoy the process and enjoy whatever comes out of the garden. Carolyn asks, what am I the most proud of that I've learned? And what am I excited to try new? So I am excited that I have learned a skill on food preservation. I understand that. I've got a good grasp on that. I can do that really easily without too much thought. And this year I'm just focusing on learning how to grow stuff in my new garden and next season I want to incorporate bees onto the homestead so that's going to be a skill I'm going to try to learn in the future. Yolanda the gardener asked what was the criteria when I selected the gardeners for this huge project? I picked them and chose them because they did my parents landscaping when they moved into their house eight years ago and it still looks fabulous and I knew the quality of work that they did and so that's why we chose them. If you watched the video where my mom and I set up her green stalks, you can see a tour of my mom's garden and my mom and dad's landscaping. Everyday Adam asks, did I grow up with parents that gardened? They had a teeny tiny garden when we grew up, maybe one or two tomato plants, a bunch of herbs, and that was about it. We didn't have much sun in the backyard that I grew up in, and so it was very difficult to garden. And we had a small suburban lot, but they did what they could do. And now my mom enjoys gardening. So this was something that I kind of grew up just a taste of, but I definitely kind of dived into it as an adult. She also asked, if yes, what were the most helpful lessons you learned from that experience? And the most important lesson I learned is you need sun to grow vegetables. <laughs> it's very hard to grow vegetables in the shade. She also asked if it's something that I wanna pass on to my children. Well, I have one baby at this point, and he's out there with me quite a bit. And I hope he just learns through osmosis and that he just enjoys being out there with me. And yeah, we have fun out there together. She also asks, what are my least favorite things about homesteading? And probably, this was a good question. I hadn't really thought about this. Probably um, washing chicken eggs. I don't really enjoy washing chicken eggs, but it is a necessity living in the Pacific Northwest where it rains quite a bit. I'm gonna redo their coop when we rebuild it probably next year so that hopefully the eggs don't get quite as dirty even during the fall and winter. I did not really enjoy shoveling mulch either. That's what I had put mulch around all my garden beds at the last homestead. And I would have to do that about twice a year to keep the weed pressure down even if I put cardboard. What I probably should have done was put landscape fabric and then the mulch. And so that is one reason why I chose to do stone around these raised beds because I was hoping that would keep the weeds down because weeding is not my favorite thing to do either. That is another reason why I put weed barrier on the raised beds. And I can already tell you that has saved me hours and hours and hours worth of work weeding. So this is probably my least favorite. I really like doing mundane things and repetitive things. So when it comes to food preservation season, I think that's why I like it because usually it's a lot of the same thing if I'm doing a big project like preserving 200 heads of garlic that's a lot of garlic to peel I like putting in headphones zoning in on a project that's tedious and just getting it done Carrie Beth asked about the chicken water that Josh made and if we can go more into detail about that 
We will when we build the new chicken coop. Currently, that automatic waterer that he had designed froze over the winter and broke. And so right now I'm just using a five gallon bucket that has waterers on it. And that works really well because it lasts for about, I think three or four days. It's probably not gonna last as long in the summer, but I can just fill that up and every couple days. So it works okay. I don't like it as much as obviously an automatic one that I don't have to think about at all, but I don't have that yet and we won't build that probably until we build the chicken coop. So yes, we will go into more detail, but we'll do that when we build it. Charlotte asks, or she says, that she has a black thumb when it comes to gardening, but wants to try it again. What are the easiest plants to grow? Any suggestions to get started from scratch? What I would recommend, or what I would say, again, we are not born with green thumbs. We have to learn how to garden. Gardening is a skill. <laughs> it's, it's an art. It's a practice and patience. And so what I would say is tomatoes are super easy to grow. They're very hardy. They, well, I should say in my area, that's the thing. Gardening is so climate specific. So in my area, we don't get very much rain in the summer. And so we don't get humidity and we don't worry about disease on our tomatoes. So tomatoes for me are really easy to grow. So what I would probably say to you is grow what you're the most passionate about. If you are passionate about flowers, grow all the flowers and then branch out into other things. If you are the most passionate about a particular thing, grow that because it's gonna draw you into the garden. It's gonna call you into it because you need to be out there weeding and watering and taking care of these things. And so plant what you're excited about so you wanna spend time out there. And on the flip side, don't grow things you're not excited about. I don't know how many years in a row I would plant beets. I don't like beets. Josh doesn't like beets. I don't like kohlrabi, but kohlrabi was in my garden two years in a row. Plant the vegetables that you like to eat. And then if there's something you wanna try, like eggplant, I've never grown an eggplant. I have never eaten an eggplant. I purchased one at the farmer's market last year and it ended up going to the chickens because I don't know how to cook it, so it sat in the fridge for too long. I'm not growing eggplant because I don't know how to use it. And so if you wanna grow something you're not used to eating, maybe purchase it at the farmer's market or at the grocery store and get accustomed to cooking with it before you put it in your garden. And where to start from scratch? I would start with raised beds. You can purchase some, uh, Epic Gardener has some really cool raised beds I could link down below if you're interested in because that's just a really easy way to get started. In-ground gardening is a lot more, uh, can be a lot more complicated with weed pressure and soil and all those things. So I'd probably start with a raised bed. Blessed Beyond Measure, she asks if I clean my soil before I use it and do I deal with gnats in my soil? So I think she's referring to soil using, that you use for seed starting. I don't clean it. Typically when people clean their soil, they sterilize it. So they'll pour boiling water in it or they'll put it in the microwave or something like that so that it kills any potential bugs or pests or eggs or larvae that's living in the soil before you know you plant a seedling in there and it reduces the risk for infestation. I have never done it. I might be gambling that maybe in the future I will deal with soil gnat or gnats. I think they're called fungus gnats. I've never had them, so I've never worried about it, but I'm sure that if I am to get fungus gnats at some time, then I will be sterilizing the soil moving forward. But for now, I just use my Vermont compost and it's worked really well. Jennifer asks if we have any plans to update the kitchen and if I'm gonna give an update on the living room, the one that's really awkward shaped. For now, we know that in the future, we will update this kitchen at some point, but it's not really in today or tomorrow's plans. We need to kind of regroup after this huge garden project that was a massive undertaking, and we need to kind of like regroup, recenter, and make a plan moving forward. If you were with us last summer, we were doing a lot of updating on this house, and there is a bonus area in this house that currently has no trim, no flooring, nothing and it's fine because we don't need to use that part of the house but i know as soon as the baby 
gets bigger, that is gonna be a really good area for a playroom for him and for friends and things like that. So I don't know if we're gonna, we're probably gonna put a hold on this so we can at least finish that bonus area so that there's flooring and trim and it can be functional. So that's probably the next thing we're gonna focus on. And yes, I will give an update on the living room, but it's not done yet. So I'm kind of waiting until it's all done and then I'll just do a big reveal. So that is a lot of questions we went through. I hope it was encouraging. I don't feel like I am an expert on any of these topics whatsoever. So I hope you enjoy just hearing from me kind of my perspective and the way my life runs. I like looking into other people's lives and kind of getting an idea and seeing how other people live because it's just kind of interesting. So I hope that you enjoyed this. I hope you maybe found something that was encouraging. And I just wanna say thank you for being here and thank you for taking time out of your day to spend time with me. I greatly appreciate every single one of you. You all mean the world to me and I just feel so blessed that we have this fantastic community. I love reading your comments. I love learning from you. I make decisions in my life based off recommendations you all have given me and I don't take that for granted. So thank you for being here. Thank you for being you, and I can't wait to see you next time. Bye, friend.